Uh, well, thank you. Uh, it's so good to see all of you this morning. Uh, those, uh, my old dad's heart has gotten wrung out this morning uh, by everything going on. Uh, I walked back through uh, four high school graduations, four college graduations um, in my heart and mind this morning. I know for many of you, you walk back through those moments in yourself. Uh, I just want to encourage you as a congregation, um, what a sweet thing it is when we reflect carefully about how we should pray for the people in our lives. And I want to just encourage you to, uh, to take that up and not wait for a graduation, but as parents today to write out a prayer for your kids. What is it that you long for them? And uh, the patterns that were here this morning were so good, uh, just taking key passages and reflecting on the lives of your sons and daughters. And I don't care whether they're your sons and daughters who are still in your home or sons and daughters who are not in your home. Uh, and they're either walking with the Lord or not walking with the Lord. So I want to encourage you. I just was so uh, encouraged by the prayers, reminded of the priorities. Um, and uh, uh, as a dad with my girls out and, and about and, and married and, and starting their families, I don't pray for them any less today. I prayed for them the first time I knew they were coming. And so... Uh, as you know, uh, grandparents or parents, you never stop being uh, a parent ever. Uh, and I want to encourage you as the family of God, uh, is that God's going to bring us people who need a family, who don't have a family. And we need to be praying for them as arduously and as consistently as those in our own families. And so God, God help us as a people to do that. Well, we came to a commencement and we're going to deal with a passage in 2 Timothy, if you want to turn there, to 2 Timothy chapter 2, where uh, it really is a commencement of sorts, where uh, the protege of Paul, one of his major uh, mentees, if you will, the person that he's poured his life into, uh, is really facing his own commencement in the sense that he's being launched uh, into ministry in the face of the fact that his mentor is soon to be martyred for his faith. Timothy has already served faithfully over these many years, uh, and uh, he's a man who could be entrusted to walk into a very difficult situation that he's walking into in the city of Ephesus, uh, but now it's time where he's going to need to serve the Lord apart from the encouragement of his mentor, apart from the, the guidance and direction, apart from the prayers of his mentor, and learn to lean in on the God of his mother and grandmother and the God of his father in the faith to follow Christ uh, in a very difficult moment. Now, we've been in a series, and we've titled it Unstoppable, The Unstoppable God and the Unstoppable Life from 2 Timothy. Uh, and, of course, we've, we've titled this here because of the dire circumstances that you find in the book of 2 Timothy, the only truly private letter between Paul and one of his close protégés, uh, more private than, than uh, even the book of Philemon, more private than 1 Timothy or, sec or Titus, uh, because he just talks directly to Timothy in a time of real dire crisis. And our goal for our series, right, is we've asked this, we want to ask God to deepen our faith in Christ, to strengthen our resolve to follow him, to guide us onto and in the path of truth and life, and to keep our steps from faltering along the way. And along the way is to be faithful to our marriages. Along the way is to be faithful to our God in our private moments. Along the way is to continue to represent Christ in the places where he puts us and to take his identity on us freely and fully and joyfully to represent him. To continue to follow God when the things that we long for that may not even, they're not bad things, maybe they're even good things, the things that you long for, God in his providence decides to say no. One of my favorite writers and, and uh, people I love to reflect on is Elizabeth Elliot. Uh, and one of her words uh, from her, and many of you who know her life, uh, was a young mom who loved the Lord, went to go with her husband down to the jungles in, in South America, uh, her husband and her went down only to have her husband killed uh, by the people he was trying to reach. 
And many people would understand that she would uh, want to turn back from the mission. But she said, no, no, this is the mission that God gave us as a couple. And so she turned around as a young mom, went by herself to reach the same Indians who had killed her husband. And one of my favorite quotes from Elizabeth Elliot is, is that God, if he's a good God, which he is, when you ask him for something, if he says, uh, if he does, says no, there's a number of things that could be here. One, uh, he's saying no because you don't need it. And it's not something that you need and you need uh, uh, something else that you realize you don't need. Or two, he says it's not time. Or three, and this is my favorite one, he says I'm going to take that away because I'm going to give you something better in its place. Right? Give you something better. And so here is Timothy in a very difficult situation and he's telling Timothy to Timothy to hang in. Now I want, I want you to think of Timothy though not as a weak person. Timothy is being sent into just a very difficult situation. Uh, this is not Paul telling Timothy to get up Timothy, stop being a weenie, stop laying down in the corner, get out of your fetal position Timothy and get going, right? God hasn't given you a spirit of timidity. No, this is a Timothy who's already leaning into the wind. He's already facing a storm and he's the one of the few that the faithful that's left and so this is the person on the side right that's cheering runners as they're already running and they're going run run right and they're not saying run run because the person's not running they're encouraging them to keep running and this is what Paul's doing to, with Timothy here and so the goal then of this kind of life is to wind up right where Paul is at the end of 2 Timothy 4 I have fought the good fight I have finished the grace, I have kept the faith, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At the end of life, right, I want to say that about my life. At the end of life, I want to say that about my kid's life. At the end of life, I want to say that about everyone that God has entrusted to me in ministry here at EBC, that that's been the testimony of our lives together as a people and as individuals. And so the goal. Now, as we've been working through, right, the book of 2 Timothy, we started off with the charge that Paul gave in chapter 1. And he gave the charge and he says, Paul, Timothy, you're going to need to lean in on the power of the Spirit to be able to hold on to the truth of what God is doing, has done, will do, right? He lays out the gospel in chapter 1. Matter of fact, look back with me at the key message that he wants Timothy to never let go of, right? It's the crucial core uh, truths that he needs to hold on to. Look back in chapter 1, and let's come down to uh, verse 9. The gospel, in verse 8, by the power of God, he has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald. Right? The gospel, the good news of what God has planned from eternity past, he's, he's promised in the Old Testament, he's realized in the ministry of Jesus, and the ministry of Jesus promises the ultimate consummation of everything that we long for, the restoration and the reclamation of everything. Right? That's the message, Timothy, that you have to live into, you have to hold on to, you need to proclaim, right? it needs to shape your life. So as we turn to chapter 2, Paul began to give him specifics, right, on how to live this out in the circumstance where he's at, right? And the circumstance where he is, is from the external world, right, Christians for the first time at this period in history are being persecuted by the secular state. They're being recognized as Christians and being killed for their obedience to Christ, so this is new in the Christian world. Up until this point in time, Christians have been persecuted uh, for incidental things in towns, or they've been persecuted largely by Jews who have rejected Christ. But now for the first time, they actually have Rome over against them, right? Nero is famous for what he did in that particular moment. This is the era where we are. This decade of the 60s is going to be a very dark decade in the first century because both Paul and Peter are going to be martyred in this decade. Paul's going to be marched outside the city of Rome and have his head taken off. Peter's going to be crucified upside down. So this is a dark moment. And so the first time they're facing the fact that the eye of Mordor is directed toward the Christians, 
right? So they're in a place where this is different reality. And before, they were just viewed as a sect of Judaism and they were allowed to continue because Judaism was a legal religion. But now they've been separated off and something's different. So Paul is going to have his life taken by the Roman authorities, right? He's in Rome, he's in prison, and he's waiting, right? And he's confident that he knows that he's not going to survive this. But he's confident that God will fulfill his promises to him and bring him safely into the kingdom, even though he will die for his faith here, right? So on the secular side, uh, what's even worse, though, that makes it more compounded, it's one thing to think about the secular people who've rejected Jesus Christ or don't identify with him. We don't expect people to embrace us in that terms. But what's even more troubling is now at this time of real distress, when the church should be coming together, it's being fragmented because there's an internal disruption that's happening. As a matter of fact, the place where Paul had spent the bulk of his labors, over three years he had spent in the, the city of Ephesus, he's watching his life's work, if you will, like crumble before his eyes. He says in chapter 1, verse 18, that all of Asia has left me right? So within the church, outside the church, there's just crisis that's impending on these two men. And Paul is writing to his protege in the ministry to hold on. And so he tells him, draw on the strength that you have in Christ, find other men, two, one to seven, right? Train them, raise up a new set of leaders because we need new strong leaders here. Then he moves on to chapter eight, uh, chapter two, verse eight, and he says, you need to keep remembering the truths that are being distorted so that you don't get caught up in this distortion. Remember Jesus Christ, the resurrected Messiah, right? That God has been faithful to his promises in the past because Jesus is the Messiah as the Old Testament promised. So God is faithful and you can trust him to be faithful for the future, And Jesus' resurrection demonstrated that God accomplished everything that needed to happen because he nullified death and brought life and immortality to life. He took care of everything that truly threatens us and he provides for us everything that we truly long for, right? So you need to hold on to those truths and don't let the false teachers take you away from those truths. So hold on to those. Now, in the passage that we're in here, he's going to give some advice to Timothy on how to stay focused in the face of the kind of attacks that he's facing, right? And if there's ever a a moment where we as the church, as far as people who've lived in the United States, of trying to stay focused on the things that matter, now is a time that's difficult to stay focused. It's not just that things are so crazy in the culture around us, it's that we're pummeled by them through all kinds of avenues that used to not exist 20 years ago. So now you get pummeled through all of your social media and through media that comes at us all the time as people are online. There's a narrative about what's going on, that the world's in chaos, that these are the most important issues, all those things. And people live, aside from COVID, under this fear and this oppression of a moment that it just seems like the the culture has come off, right? The wheels, and the wheels have come off and just faltered. So there's a time for us. Now, the analogy that came to me as I was thinking about this, uh, I'm a a World War II buff, uh, and I like to read things about World War II, uh, and uh, this is a B-17 bomber, and uh, I think it's 1942 to 44. Uh, These were being used by the Air Force uh, to try to uh, soften up uh, the Germans uh, who were uh, holding on to Europe and particularly uh, bombing Germany. Uh, And... um, this was a very intense moment. There were a lot of bombers that got knocked out of the sky, a lot of people that died in this particular moment. But one of the things that was characteristic of uh, these bombers is that they would fly from their bases, usually in, in Britain, uh, to uh, the targets that they were flying to in Germany. And as they got nearer to the targets and on the path toward the target, the flak would go up in the air. And what the flak was is simply shells that were shot up in the air that were calibrated to blow up at the altitude that the plane was flying at. And so you had all these gunners on the ground uh, who were taking coordinates and trying to gauge how fast the planes were going and then trying to send their their, uh, shells up into the air so that they would explode right at the time when the planes got into that uh, region. 
And so uh, I even watched the other day, I watched a uh, World War II era uh, training video that they took the pilots on to tell them how to take evasive maneuvers so that the gunners on the ground couldn't plan to meet them in a certain place in their course. And they had to, they had to change course and altitude every 20 seconds. So you had somebody in there keeping there, then they would change course and go up to try to outwit the gunners on the ground. Well, it was, a, it was an incredibly fearful time because you were flying through and every one of those little plumes represented a, a, a missile that had exploded. And what you didn't want to see is, I read a, a World War II veteran's account, you didn't want to see the red ones, as he called one, because the red ones were the ones that were actually exploding. The ones that were little plumes there, they had already done their uh, business and you could just fly right through them and not worry about it. Right? Well, the thing that they taught them how is how to stay focused in the midst of a fire that was going on all the time and actually other planes falling out of the sky. Right? They have pictures of other planes, the wings getting blown off, the cones of the, the, the noses of the planes getting blown off, all those kinds. Of so you're flying on a mission to do a mission and you're flying through all this flak and you're seeing actually other people fall out of the sky. And so one of the things that they took pride in is that of all the missions, aside from a weather event that caused them to turn back, or they were actually knocked out of the sky, that they had a 100% record that every one of the planes and the pilots went toward their target unless they were knocked out. And so they stayed focused. They didn't turn around. And so they learned that when they concentrated the fire, that the best thing to do was just to keep flying through it and then to get on course to do what they had been sent to do. And this is a moment where Timothy and Paul are flying through the flak, right? They're flying through it, and it's a dangerous moment. Some people have already been taken out, right? Some of the closest uh, people in their ministry have fallen. And so Paul is wanting them to stay focused, right? Now, I want to just say to you here as we think about it, what is the kind of flak that you're personally flying through? There's a lot of ways to think about this. Some of you, it's, a, it's an ongoing struggle with a besetting sin, an addiction to something, right? Something that, that has just, you struggled with over and over again, you wrestle with it, you hide it. Um, it's those kind of things that just the flack, that it just, it weighs you down and sometimes you just get discouraged with, with struggling with it and you just want to give in to it. And we live in a culture that says, don't, don't wrestle against these dark desires that you have. Just come out and identify with them and then be praised for them and turn them into something good. And some of us are in a wrestle with those kind of dark things and we want to just give up. We want to give up because it's, there's so much flack. And matter of fact, there's a lot of other people that are cheering us and tell us, no, 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 come with us, come with us. You don't have to fight that battle anymore. You don't have to fight that battle for the, uh, the passions in your soul anymore. You don't have to stand against those lusts anymore. You don't have to put that bottle down anymore. You don't have to do that. Just come on over here and enjoy it. Right? That's a lot, some personal flag, right? Some of it's relational, right? You're, you're in a marriage, and, and, and what the evil one wants to do, because we know his, his, his intentions, is he wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to make you hate your husband and make you as a, as, as a husband hate your wife. He wants to spend every moment being the slanderer that he is and trying to bring up everything about your spouse that drives you crazy, right? Some of you, it's an easier job than others, right? He wants to bring up something that drives you crazy. So every time you look at him, you think about, he does that. Why does he never pick up anything? What is wrong with him? I, like his hands don't close around any item other than maybe a fishing pole or some sports item, right? But they're all over the place, right? So why is it that I'm always third or fourth or fifth to the kids in our home like I'm the husband that stopped once we had kids? That annoys me. Why, that, why is that case, right? Why is it that this person never is tuned into me emotionally the way I would want them to be at this moment, right? I'm frustrated with that, right? The evil one wants to do that every day, day in and day out. And the world is out there saying, you don't deserve that. You don't have to put up with that. You don't have to fly through that flak. Just cut them to a curb and then go get another one, 
right? That's what the world wants to say, and maybe your struggle is that. Maybe it's with a family member. Maybe it's with a, 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 a son or a daughter, right? All those kinds of things where you just want to give up, and you want to give up, and, and you know that their social media use is killing them. You know it's unhealthy for them, and you know that every time you pick up that phone from them, you've got to hear them wail and whine forever and ever, and you say, I just don't want to put up with that anymore. I don't want to put up with that flack, so just go ahead and just live inside your phone, right? And God's saying, no, 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 if you love them, you're going to step in there and you're going to bear through, right, the near-death experience it's going to cause by you taking their phone, right? So some of you just don't want to put up with it, right? So we give up on those, let alone on ourselves, we give up on other people. So I don't know what the flack is that you're flying through or, or what is it that's threatening to knock you off course, right? What's threatening to knock you off course? If, if you're walking, I prayed for this this morning when you come in. I prayed this morning that, that I prayed, God, please help the people as we come not to be caught up in the setting, the stage. Lord, help us not to be caught up in the atmosphere. Lord, help us to be caught up in you and your truth today because the evil one wants to distract you by making you look at somebody in this room, look at something that I have on or don't have on, right? In an old day, I would never get up here with the, my sandals on here right now because that would be a tremendous offense, right, to the church that I grew up in. With. So I would never wear that. Now today, I don't know if it is other than my feet being an offense. But uh, as we get up here, right, uh, to do those kind of things, I don't want to be enamored by what a person has on, where they're sitting, how they're sitting, how their kids are behaving or not behaving. I don't want to be caught up in, in that. I'm here to hear from God and respond to Him, right? And so what, what, are, you, what are you getting distracted by? right? And some of you are struggling just to be focused here, and I know I'm guilty of it too. You're having a hard time just staying with me because you're on your phone while I'm up here speaking, right? So I'm one voice among all the websites that you're in, involved in, right? And so that's the kind of world in which we live, and it's flack that comes all the time that distracts us from God, distracts us from the people in our lives, distracts us from, from really connecting to people. So what is the flack that you're flying through, right? Is it a fear, Right? I know that at commencement, right, for high school students, you know, the commencement is you've wrapped up one stage, but, you know, hey, now you're off to the next one. So it's not like, hey, we get to rest on our laurels. Nope, turn around, and off we go, right? Or as the uh, 21 pilots say, you've got to go out and make money, right? You've got to go out and make money. You can't go back, right, and build rocket ships, right, when you were little. can't go back and do those. Now it's time to do the adulting thing, and as you're, if you're a follower of Jesus, right? If you're a follower of Jesus, you should be moving forward because the best is yet to come. And, and that gonna, we as Christians should be the last group of people who are trying to, to maintain our immaturity and our youth, and we should move forward in the mission of God, right? And so we as Christians should not be a group of people who are sending out TikToks all the time, decrying becoming responsible adults. We ought to be making TikToks, mocking people who are afraid to become uh, responsible adults. No, I don't do that, right? <laughs> don't do that, right? So, so the issue here is you want to be an adult, right? You want to take up, right? There's too many important things to do. Life is important. Don't waste your youth. Choose sides while you're young, right? Don't say, well, I get to play for another four years. If I go to college, I'm going to mess around. Don't mess around. Life is too weighty. The people around you need to hear about Christ. Your life is leaving a wake, don't create appetites in the lives of the students around you that take them away from Jesus. You walk with Jesus so that the way you talk and the way you live points them back to him, right? You can't, you can't drift around, right? Don't drift around, okay? That's the kind of idea here. So how do you stay on focus, right? So he's going to give them some advice here, right? And I'm going to just walk through. He's going to give two halves. The one is going to be about his public ministry. The second half is going to be about his private life. So what kind of things should you do publicly when you're faced with a very confusing moment where people are trying to set the terms of the discussion and move you off where they want you to go, right? So I've got four things in the front and four things in the back, and we'll work through those quickly, right? So here's our first one in 2.14. He says here, keep reminding God's people of these things. Now, the reference in this passage is to the things he just said in verses 8 through 13. So what do you keep reminding them of? Well, that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He fulfilled God's Old Testament promises and that he's been resurrected, right? And he has fulfilled everything necessary 
to free us from death and provide life for us, right? And that that resurrection is something that we enter into by faith when we believe on Him, but we're waiting for the future for it to be fully experienced. That's why today is a day that often involves hardship because we're struggling with the darkness within. We're struggling with a culture outside that is over against God and His purposes. And so it expects hardship. And so he gives him that little poetic section, remember we talked about that, where he says the way we live in the present affects our future, our eternity. And if we die together with Christ today, we believe in him and participate in his death, then we'll live together with him in the future, right? If we endure today, then we'll reign together with him in his kingdom, right? If we deny Christ, which meaning we turn our back on him altogether and never come to him as a follower of Christ, he's speaking of an unbeliever here. If we deny Christ, well, you can count on the fact that when you stand before God in the judgment, Christ will deny you. But on the other hand, if you're a follower of Jesus and you've embraced him and you're faithless, which we all are from time to time, we all need to confess our sins. We all need to turn back to Christ because we're faithless and we stumble. God will still hold on to you because he can't deny himself. So you're secure in him. But how you live today matters for the future. So Timothy, keep reminding them of those things, right? Because your your, your today needs to be informed by the fact, right? Life is short. Eternity is long. Life is short. Eternity is long. Okay? That needs to be informed by that. Okay? So keep reminding God of them. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. And what he's dealing with here, he's dealing with people who are caught up and foolish discussions, word battles, because they're devoid of any biblical wisdom and truth. So he tells him a couple things. Don't get distracted so that you let the opponents determine the nature and terms of the discussion. This is something for us as, as people of God in this moment. We have to think clearly as we're facing the difficulties of our day, what are really the issues that we should be concerned about? Okay, We've talked about this, and again, I'm, I'm not trying to give... Uh, full statements on these things, but when we came to this area of the COVID, we've reflected as a church over the time, the primary goal of a Christian, it was in in Rebecca Tuck's prayer today, the primary goal of a Christian is not to preserve their physical life. Can I at least get to say that again? The primary goal of a Christian is not to preserve their physical life. It doesn't mean we're foolish, it doesn't mean we do stupid things, but it means our primary goal is to be faithful to Christ to serve him today, and then let the chips fall where they may in terms of our physical well-being. Right? So don't let other people determine for you what's the most important thing that you need to do. You need to set the terms of the discussion. The mission of God needs to inform your priorities, not everybody else's priorities. Right? And this may happen in your family. This may happen in your, at your workplace, what your priorities are. Your, your priority at your work isn't your income. Your priority at your work isn't the the acclaim that you get. Your priority at work is, am I representing Christ accurately among this group of people? Now, all that takes a lot of things there, but at the end of the day, I want to walk away from that and know, using Paul's terminology, that the, the, the one who enlisted me, Jesus Christ, he's the one who's pleased with my performance today. That's what I want to know. So, and and just to reiterate, no matter how passionately, loudly, tearfully, threateningly, sincerely, or beautifully something is said, that doesn't make it true. So, Timothy, as you're hearing these guys that are really rhetorically polished, and they're saying all these things, and they're saying them, man, can they, they give a tweet that can cut people to the ground, right? Man, can they say this perfectly? Well, just because they say it cleverly, or they say it beautifully, doesn't make it true right? Nor, no matter how popular something is, that doesn't make it true, right? Jesus did not win the popularity contest, okay? Now, again, we've said this before. Jesus, his goal was not to be unpopular. His goal was to be faithful and out of love for the people that he was serving. The best thing that he could do for them is to represent the truth about their condition and about their deepest need, which was a relationship with him through Christ, through the Spirit, That was what to really love them was. He wasn't about what they wanted to hear. He was about what they needed to hear. 
And this side of heaven, the resurrection tells us we're going to be outposts in a, in a foreign territory where many people are walking away from the Lord. We used to be among them. And so we have empathy for them. We used to be among them, but by God's grace, he rescued us and turned us 180. And we need to be people who are staying the course. And it's not going to be the popular message. Right? Just because someone thinks that they are talking about the most important thing. Right? Let me just give you one example. The most important thing about you is not your sexual desires. That's what people want to say is the only thing that needs to identify you. Biblically speaking, the most important thing is your identity is what have you done with Jesus? Or that the issue that is the key to unlocking everything is necessarily the key, right? Some people want to say, unless you're talking about this, you're not talking about the things that matter. The issue here that we're talking about is not letting other people set the terms of the discussion, is the message being given must always be evaluated on the basis of what God says about who He is, who we are, and what life is about. Right? As we're listening to the conversations in our culture, we're listening as representatives of Christ who are trying to say, well, well, how does this make sense over against God that's ruling and reigning, of Christ who's come and provided salvation, of Christ who's going to return and judge the living and the dead, and me as a created human being who has certain potential and certain limitations as I listen to these truths against that story, is it true? Is it right? How should I think about it? How important is it? Right? That's what he wants to say, all right? Now, the second one, to move on here, B, right? Cut through the confusion, right? Famous verse here, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman that does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth, right? There is a lot of falsehood that's being given with scriptural tags attached to it, right? And so we need to be the people of God who are thinking clearly about the word of God and applying it carefully in the moments in which we're in. We need to be able to cut a path through the flack, right? Third thing, respect the threat, okay? Now, here he's coming to Timothy, and he's saying that falsehoods, right, will impact the lives of people detrimentally. This is something for a Christian, right? I don't run around as Henny Penny and worry about everything that somebody is doing or not doing, but I recognize that wrong beliefs about God can really hurt people. And what I'm trying to weigh is, is how significant is that misunderstanding about God and his purposes. And so Timothy has to confront the threat. He has to go after. He says, avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Falsehoods live out into false lives. And so, Timothy, you've got to go after it. It's like a, a toxic disease that will creep and, and kill the faith of people. So Steve mentioned one of these when he got up this morning, Pastor Steve, right, is one of the things that a Christian knows that the most important person in all the world is God. And if I elevate myself to the center of life and make myself the measure of all things, I'll get life really screwed up. If I try to create God in my own image and tell him what he needs to do to be okay with me, or tell him how I should go about getting saved, like, God, I'll do good things, and I'm sure you'll reward me in the end. Right? You get those things wrong, you get everything wrong. So be aware of the threat. And, and here, as you're thinking about the lives of your kids, you're thinking about your spouse, you're thinking about the people in your sphere of influence, as you're listening to them, how are they thinking about themselves? How are they thinking about God? What are the things that you need to be praying for them? Right? What are the truths that you need to be loving them toward? Right? So don't underestimate the threat of wrong thinking, okay? But then the th third one here is don't overestimate it, okay? And this is one of the things here. We're not people that freak out. So he tells Timothy, nevertheless, God's foundation stands firm. And what he's saying here is using a metaphor, the church itself, right? Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail. Well, he's just reminding Timothy, Timothy, you don't have to freak out, right? There are some bad eggs and they're at work in the church, They've been successful to a degree in confusing people. But Timothy, God's genuine followers, God knows who they are, so he's not going to lose sight of them, and they can't be taken away from him. And those people who truly know Christ, they will turn from the wickedness and follow him, right? So if they're known by God and they're transformed by him, then you're going to see them recognize the falsehood and turn from it, right? 
So don't get discouraged, right? Don't get discouraged as if the purposes of God are going to fall. You know, um, where we are in the United States, where we have been, uh, we've had a luxury for a long time that maybe has been a curse in certain ways, uh, that has been a huge overlap at times between the Christian ethic and the secular ethic, right? The things that are viewed to be good uh, for people to do, there's been a significant overlap. Well, now that's been pushed apart pretty significantly. And so to hold a biblical view of the human body, that it's actually a given thing, that has limits and potential, that's actually something that's hateful because you're denying someone the fact that they're just raw material that they get to fashion into however they feel. And so when you tell them that their body has limitations, and matter of fact, that their gender is an assignment from God, no, really all you're doing is oppressing them because you're keeping them from being their authentic self. As that happens, right, as that transition happens, as the very definition of love gets changed and so the people who thought they were loving now become haters and the people who are haters now become the lovers, right? When we walk into this moment, it gets the idea like, man, it feels like everything is turned upside down. It feels like everything is turned upside down. When we have a Mother's Day and they announce that we no longer have mothers but we have birthing people, and people are saying, well, no, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, no, I don't, I don't agree with that, right? And we live in a moment like that where it feels like things have turned upside down. People, Christians will go as if, oh, oh no, all of a sudden God's program has faltered, right? Now, I just say this to us, right, as people in, in first world problems, there have been believers around the world who have never known a moment's peace for their confession of Christ. And if their commitment to Christ was, was, was rooted in the culture around them embracing the values of God, they would never be followers of Jesus. And so we should always expect a tension between the values of the kingdom and the values of the world in which we're in. There have been times that have been harder. There have been times that have been easier. The evil one is at work in every moment trying to discourage the people of God from following Christ fully. Timothy says, there's a foundation. God knows who are his. He's not going to lose them. And the people who know him are going to recognize the falsehood in turn. So Timothy, don't overestimate the impact. Okay? So we're not henny pennies, right? Now the second part here then is he wants to talk about uh, the issue of, whoops, I'll get too far, about his personal life. Let me come back one. In all of life, he says, don't forget whose opinion matters. Now, he uses a metaphor of vessels in a house, and I think the metaphor is the idea of different types of vessels. And he says, Timothy, if you're going to be maximally useful to God in the church, well, then you can't get confused by the falsehoods that people are teaching. You can't be confused by the falsehood. You've got to keep using the word of God to cut through these lies so that you can see a lie for a lie. It'd be something here that they, there's so many ones to talk about in this moment to say that uh, uh, what makes you significant is your abilities or what makes you significant uh, is your looks or what makes you valuable is your ability to create cool little videos right? or what makes you valuable. We live in a culture that's constantly trying to dictate what constitutes value and significance for a person. Against that background, what makes you valuable is that you're created in the image of God. And that if you've believed in Jesus Christ, you're a son or a daughter. And if you understand the biblical storyline, you never get over that because you were a rebel, a sinner, condemned, hopeless, and now you've been made something new and everything you long for has been promised. Everything that you truly fear has been removed. That's who you are, right? That's who you are. So the issue is at the end of the day, he wants to say here, Timothy, you need to clean your life of these falsehoods because the only opinion that matters at the end of the day is the master of the house. And at the end of the day, Lord, have I been faithful to you? Have I followed you? Did I represent you in my friend group? Did I represent you in my entertainment choices? Did I represent you in the way I think about my my job and my career? Did I represent you with my wife today in my conversations? My husband, right? So don't forget whose opinion matters. And then keep your passions tethered to the truth, right? Flee youthful lusts, right? Now here are at least two things 
that Paul's probably talking about with Timothy, right? As, as a young, uh, I see this in young scholars, right? I'm not the young scholar anymore. I used to think of myself that way, but somehow I grew old. Uh, and I'm not the young guy anymore in my department. Matter of fact, it was a little alarming when I recognized uh, this year that I'm like uh, uh, second from the top in terms of being the oldest, right? At least I have one guy who's older than me, right? Uh, but when I look at myself in the mirror, I am one of those old guys, right? I just took a picture with uh, my uh, grandson who graduated from kindergarten, right? And I said, who is that old man right next to my grandson, right? <laughs> but the, you, you see, I'm, I'm the old man now. I've been, I've been down the path. And, and when I was younger, when I just finished my scholarly work, every new idea, I was, I was super excited about it. I wanted to read everything about it. I wanted to participate in all the debates about it. I want to do those kind of things like that. After a while, right, I'm, I'm still interested in the world of ideas, but after a while, most of those I've found, there's been like four or five rounds of them in my scholarly career, and they just kind of pop up, and because they're novel and new, which usually means they're wrong and useless, right? They're novel and new, and they're wrong and useless, and they, they will correct a few things, and they will make a few adjustments, but in a long hand, they die out, and they don't have any length as they shouldn't have. And so I just don't get all pumped up anymore. I just don't get pumped up, but I watch my younger colleagues, you know, they get pumped up, you know, kind of goes like that. And I went through that cycle too, right? And something about the youthful passions for Timothy, he wants to get in there and duke it out. He wants to have the arguments. He wants to get in there and make his case. And you, you get a chance where you, you lose your head and you let them set the terms, and all of a sudden you're arguing about stuff that doesn't matter. Timothy, don't do that. So they don't get in there, remember the perennial truths, keep at the main thing, don't let them set the terms, right? You keep after it, right? Keep your head about you, right? My students who come to me that are freshmen, every year they're the same age. Every year I'm older, right? And I, and I learn, I learn things hopefully as I get older, but you know what they need, what the freshmen need? They need freshman stuff. They need the basics, they need to go over the gospel, the truths of God, who he is, what he's done, who they are, what he's up to in the world. They need that. They don't need me caught up in the latest little idea that's out here that's interesting to me. And so they come out from underneath me and they're distorted because all they heard about was the latest idea. They need to know the basics. They need to know truth. It's going to shape their life and give them foundation. And so I've got to resist my tendency is to go after something because they need to hear the same thing from me over and over again. The same thing, right? We need to keep telling each other the same thing over and over again. This is who God is. This is who Jesus is. This is who you were. This is what happened to you. And this is what God, by his grace, rescued you from. This is who he's made you to be. This is what he's called you to do, right? He's given you an assignment. Live into it. That's who you are today. Okay? All the novel things are going to come along, but those truths, right? And so Timothy, don't get caught up. And I think here too, he's talking to Timothy sexually because Timothy here, because he's in a distorted place because the false teachers are telling people that they are forbidden, forbidden to be married. And we read back in 1 Timothy chapter 5 that there are young widows who are being uh, forbidden from marrying and he says, Timothy, when you engage with women your age, Timothy, engage with them with all purity. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a crazy place, right? There was a Me Too world before Me Too. Okay? Now, C, pursue character consistent with your confession. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Right? So, if I kind of briefly describe these qualities that uh, he gives to Timothy, uh, a, a life that corresponds to God's requirements, right? So I was listening to the prayers today. I prayed for Isaac uh, as long as I've known Isaac, and I've known Isaac his whole life, right? And I've prayed for Isaac his whole life, and what, what I want to pray for, and I pray this for all the other kids that I know by name. I'm praying it now for Natalie, and I'm praying it for Joy, and I'm praying for Tori, praying for little William, right, the caboose, right, at the end of the Jobsons, right? So I'm, I'm praying for all of them, right? And what am I praying? I, I want them to come to love and envision their lives in the way that Christ wants them to live. That's the way, that's a beautiful life. You know what a beautiful life is? Is having your life shaped by the passions and priorities of Jesus. 
So that they correspond with God's requirements. So the second one, they live a life consistently dependent upon God, a life of faith. Right? I'm dependent upon God today. Everything that I truly need comes from Him. So today I'm dependent upon Him. I need Him to have good conversations with my wife. I need Him to not get lost in sin. I need Him to stop me from getting full of myself and being prideful or thinking that the life should revolve around me. I need Him to guide my mouth. I need Him to, to recalibrate my thinking. I need him to work, to do things. I need him. And I want to live that kind of way. I'm dangerous when I'm untethered from the fact that I'm utterly dependent. A life of faith, right? The third thing here is a life of love, is that I want the wake of my life to be moving people toward Jesus. Well, I have to know Jesus myself. But I want my kids to love Christ. I want them to love Christ for their lives. I want them to go farther than I could ever go. I want them to follow Jesus. I don't want them to falter. I don't want them to turn back. I don't want them to give up. I want them to trust him if he takes them through the path of suffering. I want them to be people that will sit alongside of other people who are suffering and be willing to enter their suffering and hold them up in their suffering and to believe for them when they can't hardly believe. I want them to follow Jesus. I want them to love, right? And I know that's the heart of the parents here. I know it's, it ought to be the heart for our friends. I want them to be those kinds of friends, right? And then people who are about peace, Right? I want to promote harmony between God and people. I want people to be in a right relationship with God. I want to promote harmony between believers. I don't want to be somebody who causes dissension, who brings people into tension with each other. I don't want to be stirring up people over against each other. I want to be a person who's known for, for tampering down stupid arguments, for holding people together who hate masks and who love masks. Right? I want to hold those people together. I want to hold them together, and I want to go after the ones who thinks that you can't be faithful to God and not wear a mask, and I want to go after the ones who think that you can't be faithful to God and wear a mask, right? I want to go back after both of them and say, hey, I love you, but that's extreme. Let's not go there, right? Because our, our, our unity as the people of God is more important than that. Let's put it in perspective, right? So the issue here about this is I want to be together with all those people that confess Jesus. All right? And then finally, be a fixed point of compassion. And this one I can't develop here, but this is what, what Timothy, Timothy has to hold on to the truth because he recognizes you're in a spiritual battle. The heart of your child that you're praying for is a spiritual battle. Right? Parents, you know, one of the things that we hopefully learn is that when you try to micromanage your kid, you kill your relationship with them. If you try to make them be a follower of Jesus, that's a good recipe for turning them away from Jesus altogether. If you're a nanny, if you're a, you're a nagger, you're an anxiety-ridden, fearful person, right? So I want to be someone, right, that's tethered to the truth. And sometimes I have to learn that I just need to shut up and, and only open my mouth to the Lord in prayer for the concerns that I have. Because I, I, I don't have anything to say right now. As a matter of fact, I probably shouldn't say anything. And if I'm, if I'm going to freak out, I don't want to do it on the people in my life. I'm going to freak out on God in a lament psalm. Right? Have any of you had those freak out moments? I've had those where I'm just so afraid, I'm so anxiety ridden, and, and I know I'm not a good person right now to talk to somebody, so I just have to go on my knees and say, God, I, I need help, I need perspective. God, because I'm, I'm really, really worried right now. I'm really afraid for them. God, please have mercy. Right? Last couple days, um, I was walking alongside just very briefly with John Hauser. And death is a, is a, a smelling salts thing. 
because you can't confront it if you're, if you're present at all without thinking about yourself. Death stalks, right? And apart from the intervention of Christ, there'd be no hope to face it. There'd be no ultimate victory over it. But as I sat there alongside of John, and we prayed together, and John was just in tremendous pain, tremendous pain. And it was one of those moments where uh, Jeannie's sister and Donna, his wife, as we were just praying for John to hold on, to trust the Lord for this moment, to answer the question about, Lord, why don't you take me home? Well, the answer is, well, when he's ready. And as I said to John, I said, John, he'll take you home when he's finished with what he wants to do in you and what he needs to do through you, right? And so I want to be, when we sing the songs, right? I want, I want to be faithful until the end. I want to trust God. And in those moments, right, you return to the truths of the gospel and says, is Jesus Christ, is the work that he's done, is it sufficient for a moment like this? Has he really provided for a moment like this? And if he hasn't, then he hasn't provided for any moments. Right? And so Timothy, hold on to the truth of the resurrected Messiah. The resurrected Messiah today. He has conquered all the things that just plague you today. He has hope, purpose. One day, one day, we won't have to struggle with any of these things. One day. And he says, now, hold on. Help is coming. Hold on. Right? And so as the people of God, let's not get distracted by the craziness. Let's keep holding on to our identity in Christ. Keep realizing what God's up to in the world. Let's hold on to him, hold on to Jesus, hold on to each other, and stay focused. Pray with me, will you? I'm going to let you go here just after I pray, and uh, I just thank you for being here this morning. I don't know where you are today. I don't know where uh, the troubles are in your life. And sometimes, so we didn't even speak about this here because of the nature of the context, sometimes it's when life is going really well that you lose focus. And I pray that today will be a day that we return to remember Jesus Christ as our risen Lord and Savior, that we focus our life on Him. Young people that are our high school grads, I pray that, that this commencement will be into a life of faithfulness and service that's fearless, that's tenacious, that's purposeful. May you uh, be a beacon of light simply because you have a mission that drives every other activity of your life. So Lord, we come to you today and we pray for your blessing. We thank you for your mercies. Lord, uh, you are at work in and around us today. Lord, you are unstoppable. Your word Lord, your people may be imprisoned, they may be persecuted, they may be struggling with, with uh, health issues and mental health issues. Lord, your people all over the world, Lord, are facing adversity, but Lord, your purposes are unchained and moving forward without stop. And your purposes for them, Lord, to bring them to the goal for which you saved them, your purposes to bring many into your kingdom, your purposes to ultimately reclaim and restore all things, Lord, they're moving forward. Lord, without uh, a moment's hesitation. Lord, help us to live into that truth today as your people. Lord, give us strength and courage. Lord, help us, Lord, to draw on that strength to keep at our marriages, to keep at our relationships. Lord, in our private moments, to keep saying no to sin by your strength and trusting you that the good life is found on the other side of persevering against those desires that are trying to destroy us and rob us of life. Lord, strengthen us today. Lord, you, you have been faithful. Christ came according to your promises. He died and he raised from the grave and accomplished everything necessary for our deliverance and his resurrection promises the one yet to come. Lord, help us to live into that truth today. Help us to live out of that truth today. 
Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters, and we pray for your blessing, and we ask for your help in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Uh, don't forget to congratulate a graduate as you walk out.